She's putting the pedal to the metal as a budding indie filmmaker, but she's no one trick peony. She's got a violet streak. And yes, I'm using these flower puns to make myself sound more photosynthesis. Today, I'm speaking with the director of the horror short film Plant Story. She's Kelly Polk, and this is Slasher Sports Cinema. They say that I have shed innocent blood. What's blood for, if not for shedding? I'm the number one fan. We all go a little mad sometimes. God, it knows I'm here. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Sports show with Billy Graves. Kelly Polk. Hello, hello. How are you? Not too shabby. How about yourself? Doing great. Let me fantastic. That I am very happy with what you did with Plant Story. Oh, why shucks? Um, I watched it maybe two nights ago. You know, I wanted it to be fresh in mind, and I decided that I needed to give it a second shot. And I did that today, uh, just before we we spoke. And I mean, you you wrote this as well as as directed, right? So this I is did. like you you wore all the hats. Yeah, I just control freaked out on this one. Well, sometimes you got to do that. You know, it's, it's a, I guess it's a trite saying, but you know, you want to do something right. I don't, I don't know if it's about doing it right. I think a lot of times it's probably just like, you know what, this is mine. I'm going to have every creative spin that I can put on it. And I'm going to wear all the hats, all the shoes, all the faces. And you did it. Um, but your cast is strong as well. They are not many, but they are mighty. Why, thank you. And it seems like John Bergio comes up in every damn conversation I have. I and John know. Bergio probably comes up naked on every screen you see. At least once. At least once. I, I've seen that man's underwear more times this week, and I've seen my own. <laughs> I don't doubt and, that. Yeah, it's all right, though. Um, you, uh, I don't know if he's involved with Bring on the Damned. Um, he actually is. And uh, of guess, course he is. Guess Why what wouldn't that he man is wearing? Or not wearing little to nothing. You're on to something. <laughs> well, you know, why fix something if it's not broken? Right? Well, you know, I, I hope uh, you, you rewatch this, uh, this episode because I gave my best effort at your intro. Oh, okay, they're, they're flower puns, a plenty. And, you know, it's just uh, to, to end the, the year off correctly. You know, uh, this is going to be my last interview of the, of the year, even with 11 days left in 2022. This is the last interview. I'm going to do a few uh, film reviews of some common uh, common friends. I don't like, think common is right. Yeah, common friends that we have. And um, let's see, who who is it? Actually, I don't know if you know the second guy. Let me get his name. It is Alex McMichael. Do you know Alex McMichael? Does not ring a bell. Okay, well, I'm going to be uh, reviewing one of his films, but then there's Adam Freeman. Um, okay. Yeah, he's got a cool project coming up. But, yeah, I'm going to be reviewing those, but you're it. You are the grand finale. Well, hell I'm yeah. I hope I can live up to it. Oh, listen. Standards are very low here. Okay, standards. I don't know if that makes me feel better or worse. <laughs> I hope it's better because, like, listen, if I'm gonna have the likes of Ben Johnson on here, then yeah, the the, the bar is not too high. So <laughs> My the man, the bar is not very high. Oh yeah, I, I didn't realize. Ben. 
I didn't realize that you guys went to high school together till I listened to his episode. <laughs> wow. Listen, yeah, Ben's, um, you know, his mom was my geometry teacher, um, oh. like many others, you know. And uh, yeah, Ben and I didn't really know each other back then, even though my graduate, just to give you an idea of how small this town is, my graduating class was right around 100 people, maybe slightly more. Definitely not less, but slightly more than 100 people. This town now has a little over 2,000 people. At the time, it was around 1,200. So it is a very small one-horse town. I've since moved to a neighboring city, which is substantially larger population-wise. But even in the, you know, the, the classes that we had, I just never knew Ben. We were in different circles. And honestly, I don't think the film thing came up with him until you know, much after high school. Huh. So it's not like we would have, you know, blazed any trails together or anything like that. Um, I was an athlete. He was uh, the, I believe he was in the marching band, if I'm not mistaken, unless he jumped out of it. And, but, but yeah, that was, that was his thing. And I keep thinking to myself, if I had it to do over again, I might've stuck with only baseball and then gotten the music. Uh, it, it, but you know, you, uh, you get into what you're into and, Nobody's going to steer you in any other direction but yourself. So, indeed, I didn't know that ben, that ben was also a band nerd. Um, oh yeah, yeah. I, if so. if I'm not mistaken, he was a brass guy. Okay. Uh, had of, I, yeah, had a lot of friends in, in band. In I was a I was a drummer kid. Um, it was my way into being cool as a 13 year old. Um, I don't know how far it got me, but I'm here today. So. It's, that was your way of being cool. How, how'd that work out for you? <laughs> well, uh, you know, I, it got me a role on this most recent feature film that I'm in, Bring on the Damned. Uh, I'm in the Tara and the Tiger Babe segment, and I play PJ, the ditzy drummer. Um, That's from that. Okay. Yep. You see, it, you know, Bring on the Damned being a uh, like an anthology type flick, I see these stills, and I see, uh, you know, maybe not even stills, but just production picks. Mm -hmm. And I just start, you know, piecing things together in my head. And I'm like, I don't know what that's from, but now I know you, you guys yeah. are the, uh, uh, the, the Josie and the Pussycats, uh, version, or I guess, yeah, knock absolutely. Off. I don't want to yeah, call it a knockoff. No, but, uh, you know, Brandon, the director was directly redundant, um, inspired by Josie and the Pussycats and Scooby-Doo for this segment. So it really kind of hits that, that nail pretty hard on the head. You know, we do have like a different spin on it with uh, butts and innards and butchers. Um, so a little less kid friendly. Oh, <laughs> sure, still, sure. Still a good campy time. You know, I, I look back on cartoons from, you know, the 80s and maybe even late 70s. And I realized they were not as kid friendly as we like to think they were. No, even, you know, you go into Ren and Stimpy and the Rugrats years later, it's like they almost got worse. Better for adults watching back now. Um, the nostalgia mm -hmm. value is great. And I think both of those, those hold up in really fucked up ways. But um, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, things today are so, so dang tame. Well, you know, I was watching um, a rerun of Johnny Bravo, and I believe he was going to go on uh, some kind of excursion, maybe a trip or whatever. And uh, he's pulling stuff out of his dresser to throw into his, his suitcase or something. And uh, he pauses and he says, my favorite sock. Why would you have a favorite sock, Johnny Bravo? Adult Billy knows. Kid Billy didn't know so much. <laughs> Kid Billy did not know so much. Bless Kid Billy. Oh, man. But yeah, look, plant story. Listen, I had a lot of fun with this. Okay. And I, and I guess it's a commentary on social media influencers. Absolutely. It's a commentary on, you know, a few things. But yeah, the, the social media influencers was is the main one that's out there. And also with that in tandem goes our privacy. Um, you know, there's a scene where my character, one of the villains, tries to find the protagonist on Google and just Googles his name and this phone number comes right up. And, you know, that's a true story that 
scarily, you know, if we do that to anybody, 90% of the time, we're going to find their address listed right there, right in front of us. And, um, you know, how okay we are with it, because nobody's doing anything about it. And I guess, you know, people reason, oh, it's the white pages of today. But uh, I don't know, that that doesn't sit well with me. Even like the, this whole Lenza thing that's going on. I mean, beautiful pictures, friends. I know I've liked them, but the reality is that it's terrifying. We're uploading, you know, our faces and our data into these apps that aren't really well vetted and God knows where that's going or, you know, why or and how our faces are going to be stored. And, you know, with all these deep fakes now, it's just, it's it, it, the potential. It's terrifying. And yeah, so, yeah, the, I, I the white to... pages didn't give away that much info. Exactly, personally. exactly. Well, you yeah. know the, the practical the practical effects that you use here, um, I think they're pretty fun. Or uh, actually, I don't even know if I can call them practical effects. I'm probably using the term incorrectly. Technically, um, it's VFX. Um, VFX. Thank you for for the the plant monster. Spoiler yes. alert. Yeah, I, I didn't want to say anything, uh, but since you did, is that an is that an ode to Audrey too? Uh, you know, this is kind of a boring answer, but no. And I tried really hard um, to kind of separate them, and I and I realized that the monster does have some slight, uh, you know, very slight. Yeah, comparison to him. But I want, you know, this guy has like gnashing teeth and, and I really feel like is more evil looking when you think of like Audrey 2 kind of has like this dopey look, you know, almost Muppet-like. Uh, yeah. And almost him. lovable. If, yeah. If I'm really being serious. Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, this monster is, is is not like that at all. We also don't really get to see a character in the monster. The monster is uh, birthed out of vengeance from my character um, and is kind of used as a facilitator to execute somebody. I love that portion of the story, though. Uh, I really do. And I guess I want people to be able to see this. So, it, I mean, I got to screen it. I don't know if it's available for the general public. Um, if not, when is it? Um, so as of now, it's not because it's been doing its festival loop. We played in Corpus Christi, Texas at the Alamo Draft House out there. Beautiful theater, really amazing people and turnout. That was two weeks ago um, before we were at the Flickers Vortex Festival in Rhode Island. Um, I'm currently waiting to hear back on a couple more festivals in the beginning of the year. Regardless, I'm going to do um, a New York screening in the beginning of the year. So, you know, follow my socials, follow my website, because I'm going to blast that all out. I'll most likely be in Brooklyn. Um, and then, you know, it, at the very end of things, um, it's distributed through Troma now. So, um, you know, y'all will have an opportunity to rent it there um, at the very end of things. So... That's where it's at. So it's making the festival rounds. We need to get into some more festivals, though. We we have to get. I mean, we we've had some pretty good luck in, in the past with uh, you know films that are you know approaching you know um, you know the I guess the nearest festivals near them. Uh, some in Kansas City, some in uh, like Western Canada. Uh, mm. They've had fantastic luck, and I hope we can do the same get you at least in some you know something nearby you, you're in new york right now i right? am i am uh you can not see, originally like, from new york no uh, originally from los angeles which you know people are like as a filmmaker what 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 are you doing why would it's you backwards. make that move and um the possibly unpopular answer is because the people are terrible um, you know, I, so I, have, you say. <laughs> I have my beautiful friends out there that I love, but you know, this, this might sound a little cliche or pretentious, but you know, I feel like e even in the horror world specifically, there's just like a little bit more heart and soul out here on, on the East coast. And I feel, you know, it's very commercial and glossy in Los Angeles and, and people are more about like the high cred you know, and the talking points versus making something fun, making something authentic, making something because you just want to make a damn movie, um, you know, and and pushing yourself to make that happen. I feel like 
yeah, people in LA are really hung up on, you know, production value and, you know, where's this going to go, which we all want it to go someplace. But yeah, you know, it's the fakeness is, is very prevalent out there. And, and again, there's, there's some really good people out there, but they're a lot harder to find than, than I have found here in New York. Um, you know, in, in LA, I was felt like the weird one on set here in New York. I feel like more of the normal one. <laughs> so I, I can, I can kind of dig that. Do you think the same is, do you think New York would be the indie film Hollywood? Do you think that's a fair statement? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, that That's what I found. Like, you know, uh, Hollywood, you got the polished, you know, product where in new york you're more like in the the most fun i've had reviewing film has been out of new york and it's been indie film from new york indie horror specifically um yeah. or at least something that dabbles in horror mm -hmm. but but i guess uh you know since you wrote not only directed but also wrote plant story i guess we should talk about screenwriting a little bit um you know john milius you know he's an award winner um, he called screenwriting like hack work and then like went a little further and called it garbage, but whatever. So why would you ever want to get into something that even those who've been doing it well hate it so much? There, but there's a lot of fun in screenwriting, is there not? There is, but then it's also... Uh a really non-enjoyable activity at times. And it's like, you're pushing yourself to do it. And it's like, I can't think of another fun activity that you really have to force yourself to do. But then once you're in it, you know, you're on a high, you're on a ride, you know, you're taken into another world and time is just not a thing. And that's a really powerful tool. And that's, I think, you know, why I hang on. And then also just to have the control as a director. Um, you know, I've also worked, um, you know, on collaborations and I've, I've directed films that other people have written. But especially with this one, since I was playing, you know, the main villain and it was so contained. And I shot this over COVID and I wrote this during COVID. So I wanted to write something where the characters weren't interacting with each other. And sure. so, you know, um, writing myself into it, I, I had that control. Um, and then, you know, as an only child, I had to find ways to entertain myself growing up. So how I would do that is just these weird stories would come into my head. And as catharsis, I had to find a way to get them out, which is writing. Well, there is no correct way to do it. And that's what's beautiful. There, there's no formula for what makes a great script a great script, right? And yeah. like, there's no wider a plane for creative experimentation mm -hmm. than there is with screenwriting. And you, you said that you can't think of anything that's fun once you get into it, but it's like a fucking chore. I, I liken it to going to the gym screenwriting is your exercise man it is yeah. completely your exercise and that's a reason that i want to start studying scripts a lot more um you know your your storytelling i guess your powers your superpowers like they'll grow and they will not grow any faster than when you're diving into screenplays have you like gotten the chance to to go back and look at any classic uh like scripts actual scripts and maybe try to reverse engineer them? Ooh, uh, you know, I, I've never tried to reverse engineer, but I, I'm just polishing up the, the treatment for the plant story feature. And I was uh, looking a, at a lot of older treatments and seeing how, you know, that, that ended up syncing up with the actual script and The Shining was uh, one that I came across. And that, that Shining treatment is long so long um i think it's like like 10 or 11 pages when uh, treatments traditionally are like three to eight um you know depending and uh yeah you know that's somebody that really puts everything on the page um you know some filmmakers uh the story is halfway born um from what is going on on set and in the acting and in the performance but um in that script, I, I feel like everything is really there. 
every little thing. Um, you know, of, of course there are like some Easter eggs that aren't, but, but for the most part, it, it's pretty damn direct. Um, so that's, that's the one that's the most freshest, um, uh, off my mind, but, but yeah, it's, it's really fascinating, um, you know, the, the differences between filmmakers scripts, you know, um, how some people put like absolutely nothing on the page, uh, you know, completely different genre, but I'm a big Curb Your Enthusiasm fan and Larry David like gives no script, you know, he'll put like one, one line of action and say, go, you know, and, and then you get all like this amazing dialogue. Um, and there's, you know, other, other writers, you know, I really admire Charlie Kaufman, um, great person with dialogue and that dialogue is all there. Um, you know, and, and everything is a little different per genre, but, but they're also, you know, sometimes very fluid and you, and you find that cross genre. So yeah, it's, it's a really interesting thing to see how in depth a filmmaker likes to be versus, you know, giving that to the cast or crew or, or having that be more of a collaboration. Charlie Kaufman, um, he's uh, he's got like a series of just like bizarre plots. Very bizarre. And like he kind of, you know, showcases, a, you know, I guess just, I don't know if you would call it surrealism, but it's very much fantasy based and, the, when I think about his film, the the one with uh, Phil Seymour Hoffman. Synecdoche, uh, New York, my favorite Synecdoche, film. Synecdoche, New York, your favorite film. Yes, my favorite film of all time. Numero uno, really? Yep, yep, top of the list. Why? Oh, um, so first I have to say, Charlie Kaufman is very keen on writing stories about people who don't love themselves. Yeah. Um, and it's very dark, very sad. Um, Downtrodden. Yeah. And, and also people who are waiting to live their life and then it's too late. And for me, that is one of the scariest, loneliest things to think about. And that really like sits with me and inspires me. Um, you know, because it's so easy, you know, to just kind of waste our lives away and and all these distractions and, you know, it's, it's hard making art. It's hard doing anything, you know, that takes time or passion or, you know, that's not in like the nine to five. Um, and so what really like grabs me about these stories, it's, it's just, it's terrifying. Like, like his stuff is, is almost like watching a horror film because you just see the spiral in the slow, um, Oh, I'm having a mind fart, but the slow decline um, of these these characters that are just so lost and are so neurotic and they're so hopeless and feel so di disconnected from people. And that's another thing, um, you know, that I kind of play with in Plant Story is the, the feeling of connection in the protagonist is a very lonely person that is just trying to connect and, and his way of connecting is by being popular. Um, because that's what I think people, people, you know, respect. It's like, how many, how many followers do you have? You know, what's, how high is that number? Um, you know, and I don't know if people really notice this in the film, um, but the influencers, like my character and then the other main villain, who's like a big plant influencer, we have like less than a million followers. It's in like the hundreds of thousands, which is like mid range, I think now, but the protagonist just goes wild and is like, oh my God, a hundred thousand followers. That is so cool. That's what being popular is. Um, which it's like, I, I don't know, like Kim Kardashian has a hundred mil or something like, like that's, that's the bar, but you know, people, people register popularity differently. And, um, you know, that, that bar raises and lowers itself and, um, yeah, loneliness and neuroticism are, are maybe things that I've also dealt with, you know, and I've, kind of dip my toes in there and it gets scary. It gets scary. So you got to pull yourself out because 
yeah, all the characters in, in his films don't have happy endings. And I guess neither in my films either. No, to say the least. And, you know, seeing something like, you know, what Charlie Coffin puts out there, um, it really deepens my appreciation of film in general. Um, it almost makes me want to make sure that my next project is completed for sure. Okay. It's so easy to, to bounce back and forth away from it. I'm on this thing daily. Now I set aside time. I'm writing notes as they come to me. I'm not waiting until my, you know, allotted creative time, which is like, you never know when that's going to be. And, you know, everybody's working the nine to five. Everybody's got, you know, the, the hustle and bustle of real life going on that you can't just, you know, yank out a pen and a pad just on a whim, you know, but the kind of writing that comes from Kaufman, I fucking love it. And it's, it's refreshing that that is your favorite film of all time. Uh, Phil Seymour Hoffman is probably, man, he's got to be one of my top 30 actors of all time taken way too soon. But yeah, yeah. That man can uh, tell a story with his forehead. Um, man. Just, Before yeah. the Devil Knows You're Dead was probably the first time I paid attention to Hoffman. And it caused me to go back and dig up the old stuff. And I'm talking about, I didn't care how small a role it was. I would go back and rewatch Twister just to find out what's Phil doing. Uh -huh. And and I fucking loved him. But, you know, then I find myself wanting to get things down on paper, Kelly. And you ever have so much to do that it's just like overwhelming and you don't know where to begin. So like the only logical thing to do is take a nap. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. I've been there many, maybe a little too many times. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. recognizing i guess the the cognitive effect that a film has on someone like, like just like you or me and you know you you trace you know that effect back to the particular story structure that causes that effect and sometimes you know with, with kaufman i just don't know where to pinpoint what's going on until it's already hit me you know uh -huh. and you know Aristotle, you look back at Aristotle's earliest, um, I guess, dissertations. Um, he said there are two cognitive effects that stories, you know, especially the Greek tragedies, mm -hmm. would have on a person. Two things, fear and pity. And pity being, you know, sim sympathy, empathy. Um, but those are the two effects that he identified. Okay, and when when you can find the part of the story that triggers one or the other, then you can start reverse engineering. I have started playing with this very recently uh -huh. and I'm having the most fun reading as I ever have in my 40 years. Okay. And let me tell you, when I tell you, I fucking hate to read Kelly. I fucking hate to read. I do. I, I wish I could just take the words from a book and put them on a little elementary school projector. It's like an ancient practice now. Sadly, you're not, <laughs> you're not alone. I'm a big re I'm a big reader, you know, and I'm a fan, but again, like excuses from life just seem to, to get in the way more of actually just putting the book in front of my damn face. I, it's, it's not mm. that easy now. It's not, but you know, reading these stories, and when I say stories, I don't mean novels. I I mean scripts, screenplays, uh, just short stories altogether. You know, but you know, I've found that if we cannot fathom, if we can't understand the source of someone else's suffering, we can't really make a plan to avoid it ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. So we feel in this constant state of danger or a constant state of almost sympathy or empathy for that character, right? Mm -hmm. So when we reverse engineer these stories, say going back to those oldest Greek tragedies, we see the cognitive effect that is achieved by causing fear 
by basing the, I guess, the suffering of our main character in some kind of force, just mm -hmm. some kind of force that it's either very difficult or fucking impossible to understand. If you can do that, you've got legs in your story, Kelly. So the, the whole thing I'm trying to weed out of this is how do I write a story without fucking plagiarizing everything that I've heard in the past, whether it's conscious or unconscious? That is a great question. Um, that's also something I'm constantly asking myself when I'm writing. Um, you know, when I was at the South Texas Underground Film Festival a couple weeks ago, um, I met another filmmaker that asked if I had seen this film called, I think, the Car Caroline, Carolyn Witness. Um, I butchered the name, but K A R I. L-A-N, witness, and it's about oh. a woman who lives in Brooklyn um, who has a plant obsession and the plants become sentient and start doing bad things. And it was just like, I was like, oh my, I had never seen this film before. I just, you know, recently watched it, but somebody could be like, did you, did you rip off that film? I mean, the plot is somewhat pretty different, but oh, so many similarities. Um, I feel like, you know, there has been so many films and so many stories told at this point, it's inevitable. And I still think that even if it's, a similar story, like look at Macbeth. How many films have been made about Macbeth? And they are all so different. You know, Dracula, Frankenstein, now the whole Adams Family thing. Like there are so many classic stories out there that if it's a good story, Ham, I just saw um, this really amazing rendition of, of Hamlet out here, out here in Brooklyn that was done by like this Berlin production that was very slapstick and, and almost comical for this tragedy. And I think, yeah, if, if the story is solid and you're a very creative person, um, then you can make it special. You can make it your own and you don't have to feel any baggage about, you know, how it was told before. I think it's, it really is an, an inevitable thing and we just have to accept that. And, you know, if, if we see that something that we're doing has, um, you know, subconsciously seeped in that was like a really big influence, be conscious to, to respect that, you know, and give a nod to that. Because I think that that is a lot better than somebody trying to be like, oh, no, this was not influenced. What, you know, no, I don't know what you're talking. Just be honest, you know. And I think that's almost a compliment. Um, you don't have to like rip somebody off. I think there's a way that you can be complimentary um, and, and make it yours. Well, that's when I go back to reverse engineering. I mean, that that's kind of how you avoid plagiarism. You know, if you, if you can mm -hmm. reverse engineer a story, you can develop, you know, your own voice within those beats, right? To exercise your nearly endless freedom in your storytelling, right? By using the same logic, you can basically steal from the blueprint, but be completely creative in the process. And I know we're going to agree on this, so I'm not even going to ask, but we're both really fucking high on Midsummer, are we not? Oh my God. I, I can't wait for my friend Bo. Um, or don't the new, the new Ari Aster, but yeah, yeah, he is high on my list. That film, um, even though, you know, Wicker Man, I feel like this is possibly where you're going. So I don't want to jump the gun. No, but... jump, jump the gun. I, I'm all, <laughs> I'm already considering the gun jumped. Do it. <laughs> yeah. I, I kind of messed it up there, but, um, yeah. Midsummer, great example of something that you can't not watch that film and, and have seen Wicker Man and think that Ari Aster had never seen that or wasn't influenced by it. But Correct. that film is still so different than Wicker Man. It has a completely different tone, um, even though you're dealing with a similar location and, uh, you know. It's I mean, is Man there a law against having two films from the same location about a cult? Absolutely not. 
But, you know, uh, Ari Aster wrote and directed the likes of Hereditary as well, by mm-hmm. the way, and Midsummer. Okay. I've given about nine hours, maybe 12, of my life to Midsummer. And every time I watch it, mm-hmm. I get more and more upset, more and more pissed off that there are people who still claim this is a ripoff of The Wicker Man. Mm-hmm. You're right. The tone is completely different. One's about a breakup, one's about looking for a missing child okay from the perspective of a completely different point of view okay sure different characters but a completely different point of view one is very much a breakup movie and of course it made a florence pew fan out of me um what's that new one she's in Uh, i believe it's a netflix Oh, Netflix it's, join is like, it's like a the and then one noun next the, to that. Yeah, it's like not like the watcher, the looker, the yeah, it's a period piece or something. Yeah, that thing's that thing is a pile of shit, and I'll never watch it again. But Midsummer and your Don't Worry Darling are two fantastic films. But yeah, mm-hmm. that kind of go, just goes back to the plagiarism thing and the ripoff thing. And you know, speaking of period pieces, um, we've well, you brought up Robert Eggers, okay? Mm-hmm. And he's one who uh, who's big on period pieces and a lot of, you know, those Christian slash pagan themes. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, this is something that you you hint, hinted that you might want to jump into, but your upbringing and mm-hmm. maybe a revolt against religion. I'd like to hear about that because when we talked about Robert Eggers, that is really what brought that to mind. It was almost like a perfect segue. Yeah, you know, and I I think you can see this threaded in all of my work is this really big rebellion against organized religion and extremism. And yes, I was raised Mormon um, and uh, no longer am. And uh, yeah, I feel like that world just really influenced me growing up and was also terrifying, you know, um, very cult like you're, you're going into these rooms with white walls and everybody's wearing the same color of beige and, um, you know, I not a fan of people asking questions um and in demanding things of you that aren't that don't feel feel good and 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 feel right and um yeah you know my my mother was somebody that grew up in the church and my dad was a convert and then left when i was a little kid and that kind of gave me the ability to pivot later when i was like an older teenager and officially left the church but um yeah, and I think that's what also drew me um, to being a horror fan and, you know, loving, you know, these movies centered around cults. Um, I just give me any cult documentary, any cult film, um, beautiful. Um, it's just, it's terrifying. And, and again, I think a lot of people in cults feel very lonely, you know, a- another theme that we were just talking about. So, um yeah, you know, I uh, any chance to push back, um, I try and I try hard. Well, if you're pushing, I'm pushing because we're kind of on the same the same wavelength. There um, was not raised Mormon at all. I mean, I'm in a, basically in the Bible Belt. Okay, I'm just uh, just north of Nashville, Full Tennessee, Tennessee, and it's um, I don't even know how to put it, honestly. And, and, and like, if I even said another word, I'd probably end up going political. And that's not where, where I want to take this podcast because this podcast is better than that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about, I guess, more of your more of your uh, favorite directors, maybe even writers. OK, Ken Russell was somebody that that came up. And uh-huh. I mean, the. Ken Russell is a, a really funny story or actually has a lot of funny stories, but you know, he was basically involved in, okay. I just said it from Tennessee. Okay. And again, I'm 40. You're probably not going to know this incident unless you've just done your history homework. I'm not going to okay. expect you to know it, Try me. but in Memphis pro wrestling 
in the South was, you know, had its epicenter in Memphis, Tennessee. And at the, at the very nucleus of that epicenter was Jerry, the King Lawler. Okay. And back in the, uh, the early eighties, he had this ridiculous rivalry with comedian, Andy Kaufman. And of course they had uh, their spat on the David Letterman show where Jerry Lawler slaps the shit out of him and they have a match in Memphis. And well, that was just a, a legendary shoot. Well, Ken Russell was part of a legendary incident that was not unlike the, the incident with Kaufman and Lawler, but on you know British TV, he appeared on late night lineup. It's back in the 60s sometime, maybe. Yeah, 60s um, on one of the BBC channels. But he was going to discuss The Devils, which is a fantastic film, right? Yep, yep. One of my favorites. One of your favorites. And he was there with Alexander Walker. Okay, and Alexander Walker is kind of a, a snobby critic. Not like, a, you know, a Roger Ebert. He, he was just, you know, he, he didn't like the film. He didn't like The Devils. I don't know what, what was wrong with it, but... I mean, I love the devils, but, you know, Walker began kind of critiquing the film. You know, Russell interrupted him repeatedly, um, but the two ended up just having a shouting match um, right there on TV. And eventually Russell uh, hit Walker over the head with something. And uh, it was like a, a copy of the review or something. Maybe it was a newspaper. I don't know. But the whole incident took place on live TV and no fucking footage can be found of this incident. Which is bullshit. You can find any damn thing. You can find Two Girls, One Cup on any website that houses such a thing. And I can't find one clip of Ken Russell slapping the shit out of I was this, about to say, we had we know where Will Smith got his inspiration, but granted that there's no, you know visual trail from it i guess i guess that wasn't the case i guess not but you know we we have something in common more than just you know what we've talked about so far but john waters one of my all-time favorites what do you like about john john waters uh you know again he's somebody that is just rebellious and tries to make people uncomfortable and uh you know i, I think there's something a little immature almost about that um, but hey, who's to say that's wrong? Um, you know, I, the camp, I'm, I'm somebody that, that came originally from a comedy background and, um, as much as I try to write serious, I, I think it just comedy oozes out of me or that, or I'm just so awkward, but, um, you know, his, his heightened sense of acting and, and mood swings. It's just so bright and in your face and inappropriate. And, uh, you know, he really was a, um, a pioneer of queer cinema and, you know, putting drag queens on, on the screen. And we'd, we'd never seen that before. Um, you know, and having somebody like divine is just this huge icon. Um, and, and the first big drag queen icon and, and how she is still so celebrated today. Um, you know, he's, he's gross. He's, he's filthy. Um, you know, he's, he's somebody that most every mom hates and, and that feels like rebellion and that feels good to me. You know, I think if you were to ask, um, AI to, you know, draw you a stereotypical horror writer or director, um, it would probably spit out an exact caricature of John Waters, that tall, slender, just creepy guy. He's a wild guy, Kelly. He's uh -huh. a very wild guy. Like super obsessed with true crime. Super obsessed with it. Like and, and just like violent crime in general. Yeah. And like, you know, he attended trials of like some of the worst of the worst just to just to hear the stories. I mean, but he's a uh, he was a true cinephile. Yeah. And honestly, a true, you know, bibliophile. So he's the, the source material would not ever be missed by this guy. John Waters, fantastic, all time great. I'm saying top 10 all time for me. Mm -hmm. um, and he's not number 10. Yeah. So, 
Yeah. Same. Also a great writer, you know, somebody who just at the base of it, I, I haven't finished it, but I just started reading Liar Mouth, his, his new novel, which is getting turned into a film. And I am so excited about it because he hasn't um, done one since A Dirty Shame, which is very underrated, in my opinion, and not talked about. Um, and the prosthetics that Selma Blair had to go through, I think, is a bit underappreciated. Um <laughs> She is underappreciated. Yeah. Vastly underappreciated. Yeah. She's been around forever. Never gets mentioned. Mm -hmm. Never, ever gets mentioned in like some of the great performances. But she's a badass. She is not a do nothing bitch, as, you know, yeah. as my mom might say. Let's talk about Lucky McKee. Yeah. As somebody that came up and, uh, you know, he recently directed Old Man. Okay. And mm -hmm. Old Man is. Um, it's a hot one for me. It's it's got Stephen Lang. I, I'm I'm a big Stephen Lang fan, but it feels like he's getting like typecast lately as you know the the resident of a house in which you should not be fucking around. Uh, what what was the name of that film where they uh, they broke in and uh, was it Don't Breathe? Hmm, I'm at a loss. Some some young burglars um, break into a guy's house. He's blind. Hmm. I don't think I've seen this one. Oh, oh, oh I'm man, just losing yeah, here. Yeah, d don't breathe. And there's a there's a sequel. the 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 famous I, I don't say the famous scene, but a famous scene in my head is basically you know finding out that he. Well, fuck, I don't need to even tell you if you haven't seen it. Um, it just has to do with you know um, turkey baster insemination. Okay, hmm. so we'll leave it at that. I'll let you. Um, I'll let you figure that out on your own. Stephen Lang, badass. But what do you like so damn much about Lucky McKee? Uh, you know, I saw May as a teenager, and that just really fucked me up. You know, I was I was that weird goth girl. Granted, I had friends and, and didn't talk to a, a doll in my room. Um, but I, I really resonated with this kind of, you know, outsider type character who likes all these parts of different people and, and this concept of just the perfect person and putting, you know, that all together. Um, and then Angela Bettis, another horror actress that I wish she was in, in more things, especially recently, um, but, but very underrated and just visually, how do I say this without it coming off as offensive, but visually looks disturbing like, like not even because she, she's not ugly by any means, but you can tell there's just something going on inside of her. And it's, it resonates as just disturbing. Um, she's a great actress. Um, and the lighting of that film um, directly inspired me for Plant Story. And just that really stark contrasted lighting, especially in the scene where Martine, um, is is waiting for the big package to come and he's you know lifting weights it's that really contrasted dark with the light and in very like early 2000s you saw a lot of this in in horror films that what um you were seeing visually also synced up to the genre I think, you know, we've gotten more creative and, and it's it's not a bad or a good thing. But, you know, with Midsommar, that's like a, a high key light, lit film. You know, it's not dark at all. There's no real contrast except for the beginning. Um, and so it's just it was very traditionally lit like a horror film that I, I don't know, really I really appreciated and just aesthetically fell in love with and you also kind of have like as cheesy as this sounds but um you know the the kind of sally from the nightmare before christmas inspired with may this this seems this dilapidated seamstress that's just trying to again pick up the pieces of things you know i wish i had my shit together because like this would have been a perfect time to put together like some sort of award show for, you know, the, the films that came out, the filmmakers 
uh, who did their thing in 2022. I guess, though, we should probably talk about our favorite films of 2022. And if you haven't seen some of these films, listeners, fucking what are you waiting for? Get it done. I know, Kelly, you're going to go a little deeper than I am. I was shallow. The best film this year for me was Pearl. And okay, I, 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 I might be... I might be too predictable on that, but I was thoroughly blown away by Mia Goth and I'd never seen anything else that she did. Why? Because I only watch horror films. Um, I am a one trick pony and she just did it for me. As Mm -hmm. soon as I left the theater, as soon as I left the theater, I had already written like three films, like three film remakes, you know, with her in the lead role. And if I could, if I could put pen to paper today and just magically have it done, I would have her play Annie Wilkes from Misery and probably tie up Jason Bateman to the fucking bed and bust his ankles up. That's a great maybe, casting. It, it, yeah, and, and maybe not even simulate it. Maybe just really bust his ankles up. But <laughs> I think, you know, her, I think it was her swinging the axe in Pearl. And I just thought about that hammer. And she, I took a still from that shot where she chases the girl down the the driveway. And when she lifts the, the ax over her head, it's almost like she didn't care that it wasn't aesthetically pleasing. She made this face and it was like, you know what? I know I'm the hot actress and I shouldn't be making myself look ugly, but she had this look on her face and I said, God, that just looks so real. And we need to check on the girl that's on the ground. So Mia Goth did it for me. I would love to see her um, with that little accent that she used in Pearl as Annie Wilkes, which uh, took place in what, Maine, I guess? Yeah. Fucking Stephen so. King and his, yeah. and his Maine um, stories. But yeah, that, that's number one for me. I just have to also um, add to that the ending of that film when she's smiling for like five minutes nonstop and she's smiling, but you see about 10 different emotions as she is just breaking down from the core. I think that's one of the scariest parts of the whole film for me. If it's not the scariest, I don't know what is. Tears come flowing, um, genuinely looking happy. All during the, the ending credits. Uh-huh. Speaking of ending credits, A Wounded Fawn. I just watched A Wounded Fawn maybe two nights ago. Okay. I'm going to be very honest with you. Uh-huh. I've had a rough couple of weeks schedule wise. I lied down on my couch to watch A Wounded Fawn. To no discredit of the movie, I fell asleep. Okay. Okay. I'm for I'm 40, Kelly. I'm 40. It happens. Okay. Yeah, it happens, especially when you're 40. I woke up as the end credits were rolling. Uh, Isn't that unfortunate? Yeah. Because I did not go back to sleep. I sat and thought about the visual. From the, the, I don't even know what you call that, uh, the, the credit roll, whatever it is, the, the, the action that's going on during the credits. Uh-huh. And man, I thought about how realistic this looked. And I'm trying not to spoil anything for anyone who hasn't seen it because it's a very new movie. And I yeah. will spoil the hell out of a movie if it's a review of that movie. Totally don't care. Um, but I'm going to have that spoiler alert, right? I don't want to spoil anything for a wounded phone. So if you have Shudder, go watch this fucking movie. What say you, Kelly, about a wounded fawn? Um, the, the twist uh, just really got me. You know, um, twists are 50-50. Either it works or it doesn't. And, uh, you know, you're, you're playing with this, this victim character who then becomes a justified villain. Um, and, and just seeing that switch and having that that mental shift of, oh, okay, well, who do I feel bad for now? Um, which, you know, I, I don't I don't feel bad for 
I'm trying to do this without spoilers again. The original uh, perpetrator, maybe? <clears throat> correct. Um, but, I mean, some pretty horrifying things are happening to him. And uh, it's, yeah, that switch just really got me. And then aesthetically, it was it was really cool. You had this kind of occult imagery, you know, with the snake and the mask that's then um, paired with this kind of cabin in the woods like background. Um, and it was just spooky and haunting and a slow burn. I'm a really big fan of the slow burn. So I can definitely see why, why you fell asleep. Um, it, it's not fast paced really and it, it, yeah. it takes its time and i and i i think it does it well for for what it is um and yeah i was you know i i just recently watched that that had been on my radar for a couple months now i i was seeing little write-ups about it here and there and they had they were promoting it as a david lynch-esque which you know you say that i'm i'm in right away um and and it held up to it it wasn't just like weird for being the sake of of weird and, and slow and droney um, but yeah, don't watch it sleeping or sit, you know, laying down on your couch. Watch Learn it while the me. sun's still out or bright lighting in your house. I know that's not favorable for horror films. Or, you know, just drink a couple cups of coffee and then you can have the lights down. Um, Fact. Facts only. But, you know, I, I didn't fall asleep because of any boredom from the film. Because it is a fantastic film. Fantastic film. And um, I'm struggling with the actress's name Ooh, I don't the know. second the second I, I was really I wasn't familiar with anybody in, in that film I had seen her in one thing yeah yeah and like I specifically remembered it in order to bring her up but listen this cast is strong the cast is strong the it's gonna turn on a dime okay so just be ready for it watch the film i hope you'll love it um kelly what was your favorite film of the year can you even narrow it down um you know i'm gonna have to go with mad god phil tippett's mad god um or did you see it oh yeah okay i saw the all yeah all the shorts before it and then of course you know they're they're part of the 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 feature <sighs> Yeah, you know, that film, like, I was bawling during that film. Um, you know, I think it it also, you know, touched on, you know, my, my religious upbringing of what death means. What What is death to everybody? What happens after, you know, how do we feel about our bodies after death? And, and what happens to our bodies? And it was just carnage. The movie is pure carnage and exploring what carnage is when you're seeing that nonstop yeah. for two hours because there's nuance within the carnage. And, um, you know, there's like five minutes of, of these like bright little happy dancing creatures that, that put a little levity in it. But for the most part, it's it's just you know, constant chaos. And, and I feel like it, it really is a commentary on the human experience and, and what it means to be human and, and live this mortal life. Mm -hmm. Then paired also with the amazing claymation and special effects and just the heart and soul that went into making that film after so many years of trying to get legs on it. Um, I wish it was more appreciated and uh, more talked about. You know, Phil Tippett, he's a fucking stop motion master. Okay. A fucking master. I mean, his, his effects resume is impeccable. Okay. Yeah. It, uh, unable to be pecked, <laughs> Kelly. I mean, so like when when he put out those, you know, the, the, the mad guy short films, uh, I, I think they were all in like consecutive years. I mean, you just knew that it was going to culminate into this amazing feature and it didn't disappoint. And this is coming from somebody who's a big fan of the short film. I think mm -hmm. short films are probably going to be a lot bigger in the next few years. And I'm only 
half-ass saying that because I don't think that younger viewers can keep can keep focus on the screen long enough to not be scrolling through their Instagram. And it's, it's just like it's a different type of viewer now. So I think short form factor is kind of going to blow up a little bit. And maybe if they integrate something that's social media-esque, I don't know. But with that said, um, you just knew it was going to culminate into a big feature. And it, it took, what, like three decades for this thing to be finished. I mean, he would put it down and, you know, go back to it. But just imagine, you know, working on a, you know, on, on any project, fuck a film, just any project. You know, you know, you put a pin in it, you work on it, you put a pin in it, you work on it, you put a pin on it for just 30 years. You know, you take a break to work on RoboCop and Jurassic Park, and then you get back into it again. That's basically what Mad God is. And what we got is fucking amazing. Mm-hmm. And if, if you're not watching Mad God with an open mind, because it's going to take an open mind, Kelly, you know, it is. Because it's not your conventional film. No. There's very there's, little there's dialogue. No di- there's, is there yeah. any dialogue? I, in I, it? I, I, re- I really don't even think I could pinpoint a line from the film. It probably is without dialogue. I think you get like some like little sim language, um, yeah. just yeah. like inaudible jargon. But yeah, that's another mind blowing thing that this film was able to sustain two hours of of no dialogue. And, and also what's, what's really tragic to me is that Phil Tippett was such a well-respected artist who was, you know, working on Jurassic Park and RoboCop and Star Wars and, and all these films with money. And it's like, why didn't these people give it to him? That's just, yeah, that that's, that's also like a, a bit heartbreaking that it took him so long just to get it funded. Um, he's got a story, Kelly. He, he's, he's got a story that I think would make an excellent book. I would read the Phil Tippett story. Yeah, and you know, I, ain't reading, I ain't reading a goddamn thing, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm reading the Phil Tippett story. <laughs> you know, let's jump to Terrifier 2 for a second. Yeah. Okay. Like, honestly, I saw Terrifier 2 before I saw Terrifier 1. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And I saw Terrifier 1 before I saw All Hallows Eve. Uh-huh. I watched this shit backwards like like a Star Wars trilogy. And it's... I'm blown away by what was done with this film. When I heard Terrifier 2 was going to get select theaters, I said, wonderful. I'm not going to go see it, though. Because for, I'm going to have to take plans. I'm going to have to make plans. And those plans are going to fall through. Short notice, right? It's if it's one particular weekend, I'm screwed. I can't go. However, after night one, maybe it was after night two, this thing gets extended. And I I don't know when it came out of theaters, but on a budget of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, this thing banks 10 mil. We have a, a, a legitimate superstar in uh, Lauren Lavera a brand new horror icon in art, the clown. Uh And I think we've got a real deal franchise here. What say you? Absolutely. So I'm also somebody that I hadn't seen terrifier one. And actually it's a sin. I still haven't seen it yet, but I'm somebody that, you know, had worked um, in parallels with some of those folks and, um, you know, knew some of the people in the film and, and it was always like on my radar um, in the first one? Ne- yeah, in the first one. Never never got a chance to watch it. And then the second one came up and uh, never really, like, didn't, like, bat an eye to it. I was like, oh, this is cool. Again, had a lot of, you know, friends work on the film or, or acquaintances, um, you know, just kind of running in similar circles. And then, you know, I just kept hearing that it was, like, really great. You got to watch it. You got to watch it. And I, I watched it with a friend, and I it just you know, blew my mind knowing what they had with that budget. And then also, you know, working in in horror and also, you know, somebody that works in art department and and does production design and and has worked with special effects. Like I see a lot of stuff and I'm not bothered. Like it's really hard to kind of gross me out now. 
We're um, grown. We're grown. The, like the, the gross out stuff happens when you're a teenager. You know? Yeah. The, yeah. The we're, scared we're just... thing happens when you're a kid. Now uh-huh. you watch to analyze a film and have fun with it. Yeah. But, but this film grossed me out. I mean, I didn't, I, I never, I pride myself that I don't really have to cover my eyes. Um, so I, I didn't have to go that far. Um, but it was nasty. The, the mashed potato scene. <laughs> It replays in my head is just this, like, how did he come up with that? That is the most creative body defiling um, I I think uh, I think I've seen. I think that really like takes the cake. And then also, you know, it's a horror film that's character driven. And, you know, I'm sure everybody's gathered by talking about all these filmmakers is there's a theme of a, a lot of the things that I like are very character driven and character heavy. And, um, you know, a, a lot of it is about, you know, the main the main character. And uh, it's not just action, kill, action, kill, which does happen in it. And so it's great that they're able to marry that, you know, really character driven with this awesome gore and body horror and practical effects. And I just like really bow down at those guys for being able to make something so magnificent for such a small budget. And then it's also so hopeful and cool and inspiring to see, you know, like these local filmmakers who made these passion projects now make 10 mil at the box office. That's amazing. And and that like really gives me hope for like, you know, horror in the future and i think horror kind of is the the genre right now it's kind of for for lack of better puns killing it um you know it's the most creative progressive and it's always been but i think you know like we have streaming platforms now they're just dedicated to one genre being horror more than one more yeah, than one Sc- absolutely. screen box shutter i mean at, at what point did we think Listen, comedy doesn't have more than one app, okay? No. So, like, and you have two very much mainstream apps for horror film. It's yeah. amazing. And it yeah. is the genre. You're right. It is the genre of film. And, you know, I, I just spoke to uh, Scott Bradley, uh, who's an author and a very big advocate of, of horror film. And he talked and he said something that really resonated with me. He said, why do we want to share horror so much? Nobody just, you know, trades comedies, you know, no, no, nobody ever took, you know, VHSs of, of old comedies and said, Hey man, let's, let's, let's trade these out. No, that happened with horror film. Why? Because we cannot relive that first scare. We, we can't go back and be re scared by a scene that scared us in Friday the 13th part two, which for me, it was that kitty cat jumping through the window. So, what do we do? We find somebody else to pawn that fear off onto. I find my best friend. I'm like, hey, man, wait for that kitchen scene. Here you go. Uh-huh. Right? That is why horror is the genre. And yeah. and Kelly, honestly, I hope I hope you land your own terrifier too. I hope you go into something expecting very little and you come out just rich with, with experience with an outpouring of accolades i hope you do this forever and thank you that's the dream before we ride out of here i know you want to get plant story into a feature film yes and what is the plan to make that happen So right now, um, you know, I'm looking for other executive producers and investors. I have, you know, this this whole feature locked and ready to go. Um, And, uh, you know, the the short as it is, it it registers a little bit more dark comedy with horror elements. But I really want to push it more into a a darker area. And, um, you know, I I don't want to give spoilers away, but... um, the main character, um, there's a storyline with his mother 
in the short. And so in the feature, we're, we're exploring that and this, this storyline of pica and parental abuse. And um, he becomes more of a, a morally muddled character because in the short, he's, it's very clear he's good, you know, and, and he is just the good, happy, um, jovial person in the film mixed with these horrible, abhorrent characters that's just pure bad behavior. That's another reason why I felt like I had to play um, Plant Witch, my character, because I wrote, I was just thinking like, what is my go-to bad behavior? And then blow that up by 10. And so it was just super fun and catharsis to act like almost like a 15 year old brat. Um, you know, and, and kind of live that out. Um, so, you know, I, I can't do it all, all myself. So, so I need some, some good buds to, to help me out with it. But, um, yeah, I'm, uh, writing, writing the short hard with the next couple of festivals, um, coming out and, and having a live screening here in New York. And hopefully that will get, you know, more people jazzed about it and get, get the word out. Um, cause I, I think I got something fun to tell in a longer form. If you're listening to this podcast and I really hope you are help us get the word out. Let's make this thing happen. Not only for Kelly, but for us, this is a fun concept. It hasn't been done very often. And I think we can have a lot of fun with it. Kelly, you want to tell everybody where they can find you on your socials and where they can find maybe, uh, the rest of your work. Absolutely. Um, so my socials uh, on Instagram is partially hydrogenated. There's a period between partially and hydrogenated. Um, and then my website, kellypolk.com, um, has everything up there. Um, I also have a YouTube channel with my comedy group, The 13th Fleur, F-L-E-U-R, like the French version, or fleur, the French word for flower, um, because we're pretentious and the 13th floor was already taken. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a pretty simple woman. Um, so uh, if you just follow, you'll find out. Follow indeed. And those links will be in the episode description to this episode. So, for Kelly Polk, I am Billy Graves, and please don't forget to go forth and may you drink the blood of your enemies from the skulls of their children. Hell yeah.